Hi, uh, welcome. I'm Jason Rudolph, one of the orthopedic surgeons here at Coordinate Health. And tonight's discussion, we're going to talk about weekend warriors, the aging athlete, injuries, and prevention. So I'll do a uh, little talk at the beginning from the orthopedic perspective. Then we'll have some uh, other talk speakers later talking about the um, physical therapy end and rehab end and prevention end of injuries. So the uh, weekend warrior ranges in age from 8 to 80 or 90 or 100 in today's day and age. This is just a picture of uh, a young buck, Robin Ventura, back in the day trying to take on an older buck and uh, found out that you don't have to always be uh, the young athlete to, to get the upper hand. So who am I? I'm an orthopedic surgeon. I uh, specialize in foot and ankle surgery, trauma, as well as sports injuries. I've been practicing in the region actually for now 14 and a half years since this slide was made. I've been working here with Coordinate Health since 2011. I am board certified in orthopedic surgery. I live locally, therefore I treat patients like friends and neighbors. Uh, I played NCAA Division I football, so I've suffered most orthopedic injuries, and if I haven't suffered them, I at least know somebody that has, and I know what it's like to therefore be a patient. Uh, quickly, the outline we'll run through. First, we'll uh, discuss overuse injuries in hips, knees, ankles, and feet. Then we'll talk about the acute injuries um, in knees, ankles, and feet as well. So the definitions first. What, what, what is an overuse injury? Um, any sort of inflammation of a body part due to either too much stress on a normal area or normal joint or abnormal stress on a, a normal joint. And we'll kind of get into that a little bit later as well. Um, any sort of repetitive activity to a specific body part. And some examples that I just mentioned is somebody that decides they're going to try to install a, a roof on their house all in one day. Uh, somebody that decided they're going to do some high-level uh, exercise regimen for the first time ever and do it all the first day. Taking up jogging, uh, even though you haven't jogged in 10 years since you graduated from college. All these things are overuse injuries. Uh, some more definitions. Tendinitis. First of all, a tendon. Just to understand what a tendon is. A tendon is the structure that connects muscles to bones. So tendons move. Uh, bursitis. The bursa is actually a, this little fluid-filled sac between the skin and a bone, and they're in all different areas in our body, and the concept is, is to decrease friction between the skin and the bone, or between muscles and bones. Uh, stress fractures, these are overuse injuries directed specifically at bones. And I mentioned this paperclip concept, which I'll get back to a little bit later. Trochanteric bursitis, so this is our first overuse injury we're going to discuss. Uh, the, tro uh, the greater trochanter is this point of bone that you, everybody feels on the side of their hips. It's not your hip joint, but it's this bone on the side here. And in that joint, like we talk, or in that, over that bone, like we discussed, is a bursa. The concept of this bursa is it's supposed to prevent your skin from gliding right against your hip bone. It's also the attachment point for several muscles that help to move your hip or your leg. Symptoms of, oops. So symptoms of trochanteric bursitis. Uh, again, it's pain localized right to the side of your hip. If you roll onto that side at nighttime, it may wake you up. Some people feel pain radiating down the side of their leg. Uh, risk factors for developing trochanteric bursitis. This is, again, an overuse injury, so repetitive activities such as bicycling, stair climbing, or running. Or on occasion, somebody will fall and think they broke their hip. Well, in fact, they've just landed on the side and really inflamed that burst on the side of their leg. This is a, uh, just a uh, rendering of this trochanteric bursa. If you look on this side, this is the, the hip joint. So this greater trochanter is this part of the bone sticking way out on the side, and the bursa is on the side here. So if you look on the other side where the muscles are, this bursa is right on the side underneath this uh, muscle over here. Okay. Treatment for trochanteric bursitis is almost universally non-surgical. And we'll mention with all these overuse injuries, you'll see there's, there's some repetition on how we treat these things. So non-surgical activity modification. Whatever that set this thing off, we want to either stop it or at least cut back on it. NSAIDs, that's our formal term for non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. In other words, ibuprofens, naprosins, and some of the prescription ones that we use. Cortisone injections. A cortisone is a, is, a, is a liquid form of an anti-inflammatory. And when it's in a liquid form, we can now inject it. So these are, you know, if you ever hear about somebody that gets a steroid shot in an area. Uh, and physical therapy, which again, we're gonna get into a little bit later, is, is, a, is a real important part of these sort of things. Stretching programs, strengthening, and, and sometimes it is changing your gait pattern, how you walk. 
Surgery is almost never indicated in uh, trochanteric bursitis. On occasion, somebody will have this for years and years and years, and the only options left are to surgically remove the bursa. Patella tendonitis. Now we're dropping down a little bit later, and again, this is another one of these itises. This one's the tendonitis of your patellar tendon. The patella tendon is a very important structure. It connects your kneecap to your leg bone. So it's extremely important in just about every activity, running, jumping, kicking, even just walking. Symptoms from patellar tendonitis include pain along the length of the entire patellar tendon. It can be intermittent or it can progress to being persistent throughout the day. This is now a, uh, another rendering of the patellar tendon. So no muscles are seen here, but this is your kneecap and this important structure connecting your kneecap to your leg bone is this patellar tendon. Causes, again, overuse. This is one of the more common overuse injuries that we'll see. Due to repetitive stress on the patellar tendon, which can cause multiple tiny little tears in the tendon. If those tears uh, are continued to uh, undergo the stress, sometimes they can either not heal or turn into more of a chronic problem. Risk factors, again, high intensity or high frequency of specific activities. If you're jogging and then decide that you're going to make it into a marathon, that's an increase in a specific activity level. Uh, overweight sometimes can contribute to it. Tight leg muscles, we just I mentioned the quadriceps here. And a muscle imbalance is something that we'll see in more of our athletes that decide they're going to do a lot of squats or a lot of leg extensions, but don't balance it out by getting their hamstrings just as strong. And that's something I'm sure the therapist will talk to you about in a little bit. Treatment, again, remove the stress. In this case, rest doesn't mean no physical activity at all, but just modifying your activities. If jumping and, and uh, uh, basketball or volleyball are the things that set this off, we can still keep you in shape, just changing your activities, maybe more of a, a elliptical or a you know, recumbent bicycle. Physical therapy plays a key role in patellar tendonitis. Again, surgery, like most of these overuse injuries, is rarely indicated, and usually only conservative techniques have, have failed for up to 12 months before we ever discuss surgery. Achilles tendonitis, another tendon, now we're moving further down the leg. This is the large tendon that connects your calf muscle to the heel bone. Uh, the blood supply is sort of important in the Achilles tendon. The blood supply comes from two spots, either from the muscles above or from the bone below. Therefore, there's a middle section of that tendon that has a poor blood supply, and anything that has a poor blood supply is susceptible to both acute and overuse injuries. Symptoms, what you would expect, pain along the tendon. Sometimes the pain is just at the end of the tendon where it connects to the heel bone, sometimes it's in the tendon itself. Again, can be bad after exercises or at some point it can be persistent and just painful throughout the day. Similar treatments and risk factors again, so overuse injuries, repetitive activities, this microscopic tearing can occur. And again, if these microscopic tears turn into chronic tears, turn into scar tissue, then we're on to something called tendinosis and a little bit fancier term, but in general, just think now that instead of having a normal tendon, you have a big, thick, scar-filled tendon. And again, a little artist rendering. This is looking at your leg from behind. So the red or the big calf muscles turns into a band of tissue, turns into our big, thick Achilles tendon that attaches to the heel bone. Treatment, again, like all these things, primarily non-operative stretching, bracing, casting on occasion for people that are just so painful that even moving the Achilles hurts too much. I never recommend cortisone or steroid injections in this particular area. Injections uh, around inflamed Achilles tendons have been shown to occasionally cause a rupture, and if your Achilles is ruptured, then it's all of a sudden become a surgical uh, urgent uh, procedure. Some of the newer modalities we may hear about in the news, plasma-rich proteins, which are taking some of your own blood, spinning it down, and sometimes getting together this, uh, these growth factors that in theory and not necessarily completely proven scientifically may help. Uh, operative treatment, again, like most of these overuse injuries, is only when conservative care has failed. Uh, in the Achilles, we break it down to two spots. If the pain is where that Achilles tendon is inserting onto the heel bone, sometimes there's a spur in the area removing that spur and then reattaching the Achilles tendon may be important. If the tendon uh, is thickened in the body of the tendon itself because of this chronic scarring of the tendon, that's this tendinosis, in which case 
you have to try to remove as much of the scar as possible. And now, in order to support the Achilles, you may need to transfer another tendon into the area to strengthen the area. Plantar fasciitis, this is a very common thing in almost every universally, whatever, any talk I've done, somebody in the audience knows or has had plantar fasciitis. Um, this is the most common cause of not only heel pain, but almost whole, uh, all foot pain. Um, it's caused by microscopic tears in the plantar fascia. This is the one everybody thinks they have heel spurs. It really doesn't have anything to do with the spur. It's this band of tissue that runs from the heel to the ball of your foot. Uh, it helps to maintain the arch. Classically, pain is worse when you first wake up in the morning or after prolonged sitting. It loosens up as you begin walking or uh, um, as you stretch the, uh, stretch the fascia out. You can also have pain just after certain activities. So here's the end shot of the, he of the foot, heel bone, this plantar fascia is the band that goes all the way out to the front of your foot, and this area in red is the spot that always develops this plantar fasciitis. Causes overuse, like all these things, weight gain, changing activities or taking up a new activity, and most of the time we don't really know what causes it, but we know it's there. Treatment, again, is almost always non-surgical, and obviously I wrote it down three times. Stretch, 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 and there's a million ways to stretch, both on your own, through physical therapy, or we add orthotics, which are inserts in your shoes, night splints that stretch you out throughout the night, um, and again, I put in NSAIDs, which are the uh, anti-inflammatory medications. Surgery is very rarely indicated, but does occur. This is a very common problem, therefore not everybody gets better, so maybe five to 10% of people with the severe symptoms that don't get better over six to 12 months may require surgery. And the surgery essentially is the ultimate stretch. We release that band of tissue. Stress fractures. Now we're talking about overuse injuries localized to the bone. And this is this paperclip concept I was describing. If you imagine taking that paperclip, stretching it out and bending it, first it gets warm, then you keep bending, you get tiny little cracks in it, and that's when you're in that stress fracture level. If you keep bending, it can break in half, and that's when we'll see actually a fracture on x-ray. So most of the time people will come in when it's at that point where the, the paper clip is a little warm and has tiny little cracks in it. Uh, stress fractures can occur anywhere, primarily in our weight-bearing joints, so the tibia or your leg bone, your heel bone or your calcaneus or your metatarsals very commonly, which are your foot bones. Diagnosis, usually again the x-rays are normal, we're in that early stage. Sometimes either an MRI scan or a bone scan is required to actually improve the diagnosis. Treatment simple stress fracture eliminate the stress how do you do that change the activity what if you were, if you develop this from running unfortunately you have to stop running for a period casts boots braces um, we have some newer modalities including bone stimulators for people that just don't seem to be healing injections this is getting a little bit out there but in general surgery is very rarely indicated the majority of the time these will heal on their own once we remove the stress hallux rigidus easier way to think of that is arthritis of your big toe joint. Um, it's essentially wearing down of the cartilage where your big toe connects to your foot joint. So where your, your phalanx connects to your metatarsal. It's extremely common in former athletes and runners. Um, this joint takes in a high amount of stress, particularly during running and jumping sports. So if it takes a lot of stress, eventually it can wear down. Causes again, it can either be from an overuse injury or a single hyperextension event, the turf toe injury. Everybody always remembers the old linebacker from the Steelers, uh, Jack Lambert, who had to retire because of turf toe. It's not really the turf toe, it's the arthritis that develops afterwards. Symptoms are pain right in the front of your foot, swelling, bony deformity, and limited motion to the joint. Diagnosis is usually done in the office where it hurts x-rays confirm arthritis, and treatment, we always try non-operative treatment for these sort of things first, changing your shoes, perhaps an orthotic with an extension that lets the toe, uh, limits the toe's motion, steroid injections and, and uh, oral pills. Ultimately, surgery may be needed for hallux uh, rigidus or arthritis. With mild arthritis, it's one of the, uh, we can try a clean out surgery, we just shave down the bone spurs, try to loosen up the joint a little bit. If the arthritis is severe enough, then the uh, primary treatment is an arthrodesis, where essentially we take that joint and fuse it together so it becomes one big bone. Once it's one big bone, it can't hurt, doesn't move, and people do very well and are very active afterwards. Now we're to uh, some of the more common acute injuries or traumatic injuries. Uh, a torn meniscus, we're in the knee joint. 
Uh, the meniscus is essentially the shock absorber cartilage between your femur and your tibia bone. There's an inside one called the medial meniscus, an outside one called the lateral meniscus. Both are these C-shaped uh, uh, cartilages. They have a uh, very poor blood supply, unfortunately. Only the outer third have a, uh, a blood supply, so therefore the only, only the outer third has the potential to heal if it's torn. Causes of a meniscal tear, either a twisting injury to the knee joint, a hyperextension injury, or again, these can be repetitive injuries, particularly in the older athlete when the cartilage loses some of its uh, uh, moisture, loses some of its uh, uh, um, integrity, and all of a sudden can become more prone to tearing. Symptoms, knee swelling, classically patients will call, uh, complain of catching, locking, instability, feel like, uh, like there's something caught in the knee joint causing loss of motion. Uh, diagnosis is done both clinically, one of us pushing on the knee, twisting the knee, and ultimately MRI scans are very useful at diagnosing a meniscus tear. Here's a uh, pretty awful knee injury which hopefully none of us will ever have to endure. So the torn meniscus, unlike overuse injuries, usually this becomes a surgical problem. For somebody that really wants to avoid surgery, we can always try injections and physical therapy, but ultimately, if it's a true torn meniscus that's causing pain, catching, and locking within the knee joint, it requires surgery, essentially arthroscopic removal of the torn fragment. By arthroscopy, now we're talking little poke holes instead of big incisions, and we, we do a lot through little poke holes and small instruments now. Occasionally, and very rarely, you can repair this. That's usually in the uh, very young athlete who happens to have a tear on the periphery or on that outer third. Achilles rupture, very common in what this talk was directed to, our weekend athletes. It's very common in the 20 to 40 year old, 40, 50 year old athlete even. Causes an eccentric force on an already stressed tendon. Now that's a fancy way of saying if that Achilles tendon is already tight and takes a little bit more force to it, all of a sudden that tendon can tear. Classically, basketball. You land awkwardly after jumping. You go to plant and move, and all of a sudden you feel something pop behind your heel like somebody kicked you. Turn around, there's nobody there. Next thing you know, that ankle just isn't moving. The other way you can tear your Achilles is trying to run to first base while making the last out in the World Series. That's a little dig at the Philly uh, fans in the, in the audience. And there's Ryan Howard a few years ago stumbling towards first base after he tore his Achilles tendon. So these symptoms of an Achilles rupture. You feel this one, snapping, tearing sensation in the heel. Some people liken it to being shot in the calf or the heel. You have acute weakness, inability to push off. The diagnosis is usually pretty easily made in the office. We might do MRI scans just to confirm it or to kind of prove how extensive the tear is. Treatment, this is one that you rarely treat non-operatively. Usually it's treated surgically. The non-operative will be people that just can't tolerate a surgery. It can be done with casting. We'll, uh, put you in a cast and progressively uh, change the position of the cast over a six to 10 week period. In general, this is treated operatively, repairing the sides of the tendon, starting an early physical therapy program. Usually you'll be walking in shoes by six weeks and back to full sports by six months. A chronic ankle sprain, uh, ankle sprains we all know, it occurs when you either land awkwardly or land on a plank or a board and turn your ankle, land on somebody's shoe while playing basketball. A chronic ankle sprain is one where that ankle keeps spraining. You hit a rock or a bump and you keep tearing, turning that ankle. Eventually, the ligaments, which are the ropes on the outside, are stretched out so much that even through having a, very, a strong ankle, even after going through physical therapy and wearing, wearing braces, those ligaments are so stretched out that they simply won't hold the foot and these are the people that end up needing a, perhaps a surgery to tighten those ligaments. So there's your classic basketball player ankle roll. Symptoms of a chronic ankle sprain, pain on the outside of the ankle, an instability-like feeling where the ankle just feels like it's giving out all the time. It doesn't have to be a huge sprain. It just might be you, you step on a pebble or a rock and the ankle just tweaks a little bit. Uh, the athletes are unable to play in cutting activities, unable to walk on uneven surfaces, even just walking across a soccer field sometimes. Diagnosis, again, a physical examination, where you hurt, an anterior draw sign is a special test that we do just to test the integrity of that ligament to see if it does slide a little bit too much. X-rays are usually normal, MRIs sometimes help out in improving the diagnosis. Non-operative treatment. If that ankle is unstable because you just never went through physical therapy, never developed the strength, then clearly physical therapy is the way to go. 
get it stronger, retrain the nerves, retrain the balance, get the proprioception back, uh, bracing to, to prevent it from spraining, rarely cortisone injections. Once you've failed all that, then we get into the operative treatment, an arthroscopy of the ankle, just like the knee. The instruments are a little bit smaller, but the same concept. We go into the joint, clean out all the junk and scar tissue. But in this case, we now have to tighten up your own ligaments. Very rarely do we have to create a ligament. The ligaments are there, they're just sort of stretched out, and our job is to tighten them up a little bit. So that uh, sort of concludes my talk on the aging athlete. Here's a good picture of an aging athlete, and uh, certainly hope <laughs> that could be his age, or the year, yeah. Maybe the, the, the minutes left, so thanks. So, uh my name is Jared Kohler. I'm a physical therapist here at Coordinated Health for about six years now. And uh, as you can see on most of the slides, Dr. Rudolph talked about physical therapy was an option for pretty much any injury here. Uh, some of the concepts of this weekend warrior that you see are overuse injuries, overweight, you're having alignment issues, tight structures, and weak structures. Sometimes it's one of those, sometimes it's all those, but in a combination, uh, you know, that can result in an injury where you might need physical therapy. So he spoke of the trochanteric bursitis here and how that bursa sac, which is a fluid-filled sac to help the tendons and the muscle move over there gets inflamed. Uh, when you come to therapy, we look at your alignment, we look at your strength, and that combination can cause more inflammation there. So what we're gonna tr attempt to do is address any imbalances, if you have weak hip muscles, if you have tight hip muscles, sometimes that results in more friction. More friction is gonna cause more inflammation there. So that's typically how we address that. We also use modalities. We use ice. We can use ultrasound. Uh, but again, the most important thing is just working on those imbalances. I think the next one's the knee. Very similar with patellar tendonitis, I would say, as far as overuse injuries, uh, weekend warriors and athletes, this is one of the most common things we see. Uh, a lot of times, you know, a knee problem is not just a knee problem. Sometimes we see those muscle imbalances, tightness, weakness in both the hip and the ankle. Uh, we treat patellar tendonitis kind of globally when we see the patient. We look at them and we're trying to establish are they having weakness in the hip, the knee, the ankle? Are they having problems with alignment at the knee? Is it coming from the ankle? We can use orthotics. We can again use the similar modalities, the ultrasound, the ice. Um, there's a, a new product that's been used the last couple of years, Kinesio Tape. Uh, we do use that usually with acute injuries to try to just take some of the friction off that. I do have some pieces of the tape if anybody wants to play with that. Uh, you can go to the next one. So to address overuse injuries, I'm going to kind of put all the foot into one here, the Achilles tendonitis, the plantar fasciitis, uh, some of the uh, stress fracture issues. So you have a picture, and this is a good picture, that's why I brought it up to here, how many women who are athletes who are running on the weekends, who are playing sports, are in a high heel that makes their foot like that all day. So we talk about Dr. Rudolph talked about how stretching is so important, but if you're wearing this shoe eight hours, 10 hours a day, and then you're expecting to go home and run a couple miles, you're putting yourself at a disadvantage there. You can see that little crinkle right here. That Achilles tendon is gonna get tight. So you're gonna put more stress on the tendon. You're gonna put more stress on the Achilles, the Achilles tendon as well as the plantar fascia and sometimes that increased pressure, you can see how most of the weight is on the forefoot there, and that can lead to stress fractures. So to be proactive is key in this. If you know you wear high heels and you know you're involved in athletics, you really need to be stretching. You can go ahead, a couple of slides. Um, the hallux rigidus is something that we do treat in physical therapy. Uh, when it gets to the level of arthritis, it's a little tougher to treat. Uh, that's when you go to the surgical issues or the surgical options that Dr. Rudolph talked about. We just wanna make sure that you have 
the right flexibility in your ankle, the right flexibility in that great toe, so you're walking normally. Usually what we'll see in physical therapy is you don't have that normal motion that you need in your ankle or your toe. So you start altering the way you walk, increase stresses, cause increased pain, and then it starts down the road of arthritis there. Go ahead. Uh, the torn meniscus, you can go one slide more there, one more. The torn meniscus is uh, something that we do treat as well, uh, not so much preoperatively. If it is a, a chronic meniscal tear, something that catches here or there and you have issues where you know, you're kneeling or doing some activity over the weekend where you get it flared up, you can come in for non-operative treatment. Again, the ice, uh, we're gonna take a look at everything, make sure the strength's there, the flexibility is there. If it, physical therapy doesn't work, then we usually refer you back to Dr. Rudolph and you talk about surgical options. That guy needed surgical. Uh, the Achilles rupture, very rarely we'll see this preoperatively. I uh, talked a little bit about postoperatively. That's uh, usually an injury that needs surgery. It's very difficult to do anything without your Achilles tendon. But again, when we see them postoperatively, more and more aggressive techniques are used. We're getting them walking sooner and you're getting back to sports sooner. Go ahead. Chronic ankle sprains is, is a big one. Um, the literature out there says that if you have one ankle sprain, your incidence of ankle sprain goes up significantly after that. A lot of people, especially basketball players, that, like that picture showed, you, you sprain your ankle, you go to the trainer, you tape it up, you keep working on it, but the issue is we have receptors in the ankle that tell the brain when the muscles in the ankle need to work. When you sprain your ankle, those proprioceptors decrease and then that relay gets slower. So the next time you go to step on somebody's ankle, usually less severe, you're gonna have the same type of injury. The ligaments get stretched out more, the muscles stop working, and then eventually you're gonna to lead to failure and, and possible surgery. So very important to address, you know, initial acute ankle sprains as soon as possible. Keep going. So there's the runner. So uh, again, we talk about these overuse injuries and, and physical therapy is an option to treat all of them and, and we'd love to have you, but the better approach is to be more proactive. If you know that you're stepping out, you're trying a new sport, you played basketball through college, you've been working for five years and all of a sudden you wanna join a men's league, we want you to you know, attempt to be proactive in getting back in shape, starting to stretch, and uh, that's where Frank comes in. So I'd like to introduce Frank, and he's gonna talk a little bit about preventative uh, therapy to try to avoid these injuries. Thanks, Jared. Thanks, Dr. Rudolph. Uh, like Jared said, my name's uh, Frank Lupin. I'm a certified athletic trainer and exercise uh, physiologist. I've uh, been doing this for a long time. Uh, through our PULSE program, we do personal training, small group exercises. Uh, when someone comes to us, sometimes it's uh, in preparation, sometimes it's after the fact, after they've seen uh, Dr. Rudolph, they might have had surgery, a tendonitis, and they've seen Jared, and they're ready to go back to their activity, and they still want some, build up their confidence that they can go back to uh, their, their weekend activity. It doesn't have to be a weekend activity like one of these that you see up here. Uh, you know, the weather broke, everybody's feeling pretty good want to get outside, you know, gardening could be your weekend warrior activity, you know, you're, you're down, you're up, you're, you're, you're hauling dirt around, mulching, things like that. So, you know, when we say weekend warrior, we think about that athlete, but, you know, when the weather breaks, we're all getting outside and doing something. So, um, what we like to do when we, we first get, uh, take a look at people is we like to kind of check under the hood and see what, what's going on. Uh, a lot of people do get involved into their conditioning program, but before you get into your conditioning program, uh, we need to see what's, what's going on. A lot of people think strength, power, speed and agility, depends on what your, your weekend sport is, you know, if, it, if it's a high level. Uh, can we go back one? Okay, <clears throat> you know, something simple as hiking, some people think that's a low level activity, Well, that can be pretty stressful. You're out there, you can turn your ankle, you can slip on the rocks. Uh, you know, some of these other activities, we're, we're, we're getting out of the ski season. Uh, you know, there's a whole host of, of injuries that, that, that can occur here. Uh, so it's not just the strength and things like that. 
Uh, we need to look at the flexibility issues. We need to look at balance. We need to look at coordination because those things can get, get us into trouble also. Uh, a lot of times, pain is a power motiv motivator. Uh, you've seen Dr. Rudolph, you see Jared, I'm feeling pretty good, and we stop doing the activity because I think I'm fixed, okay? And I go back and I start doing my ac exercise again, all of a sudden, oh boy, that's, that's starting to come back on me. Well, you probably stop doing some of your basics, okay? Uh, and your body's gonna slip back. Our, our lifestyles are that we sit all week, right? And now I get up and here comes Saturday, you know, I'm ready to go and, and we jump right back into it. Well, when we take a look at under the hood, we, we wanna go back to the fundamentals, the basics. That's really what, what happens. And just kind of give you an idea on what we do with you uh, when you go back into the, in, to your weekend sports. We wanna do a screening. We wanna, you know, our cardiovascularly is number one because if without your heart, okay, um, you're not gonna be able to do those orthopedic activities. So I wanna make sure that we have we have a good cardiac system uh, before we go and we start doing these activities. Uh, so we'll check heart rate, we'll check blood pressure. We actually take you through a PAR-Q uh, to get a good medical history. Is there a history of diabetes and things like that? Get a clearance that way. Um, and then what we'll do is we'll take you through the musculoskeletal screening because that's really what you're out there working on and that's where we see most of our injuries uh, throughout the body. Um, so we want to assess the basic fundamentals of movement when, you, when we, we come back. So when you're in physical therapy, let's say you're in for an ankle injury or a knee injury, okay? That's gonna be their focus. They may not have been able to address your upper body. So we wanna assess the whole system and see that your shoulders are still okay if you're going out for a tennis activity, all right? So we don't end up with a rotator cuff problem. So we take you through this uh, fundamental movement screen uh, to identify any risk factors that are gonna put you at risk for those tendonitis, for a, a problem down the road. So when we identify that, we're gonna to look to try to restore and correct any of those deficiencies to prevent the injury and ultimately optimize your performance so that you're gonna enjoy that activity, all right? So that it is fun again. A couple of the skiers that came back to me this year that went out west, that they were just as happy as could be because you know, skiing out there, usually it was painful for them after a couple of days. This year they came back after, after training for a while they said they felt like kids again. Their knees didn't hurt, their backs didn't hurt, they were able to, to do more runs and they weren't tired at the end of the day. Uh, so you wanna get yourself into shape for those weekend activities after you've been sitting all week. Uh, so just a couple things, a couple times a week can really make a big difference. All right, when we take you through the screen, we wanna look at your abilities, okay? How many of those abilities um, do you still have, all right? So our screening looks at Basically, it's, it's a, a spin-off of what we call, what child development is. It's called the functional movement screen, all right? It takes the seven fundamental patterns that we had when we were infants, and it builds on that. Sports and our weekend activities are really a skill, okay? The body's abilities go back to the basics when we were learning to roll, crawl, kneel, stand, walk, no one was standing there telling us to do more squats or do more crunches to build up our core. It just kind of happened and that whole system was a neurological feedback from the brain to the muscles. So the software and the hardware were working great back then. And then we sat down, okay, we got a job. Things started to shut down because the body said, hey, I don't need this anymore. So it kind of encouraged tightness and weakness. And then we get up and we try to go throw, catch and kick and dribble on the weekend because we did that in high school and we did that in college. And mentally, we're still 16, right? But physically, we're, we're 50, okay? And so we wanna try to reset the system if we can, get the software and the hardware working better together so that you can do that. So that's what this screening does for us, all right? Seven simple concepts. Not everybody can do this though, okay? Some of you in the audience would not be able to do the overhead squat. So we kind of take into account who we're dealing with when we're screening all right, we put the body in a compromised position. And what that does is that helps tweak out something that might be underlying that you're not feeling yet. And then that exposes that to us and we can say, aha, here's something that might come up down the road that we need to address in your program or at least correct before we start putting you maybe on a leg press or before we have you do some actual squats. The overhead squat will do that. So one's a hurdle step and 
those are the seven and that's kind of what the overhead squat starts out to look like all right um, and we put you in that position for some of our older clientele we would have you actually just get in and out of a chair and see what that looks like how much weight do you use on your arms okay how low can you go all right that kind of a thing we look for a weight shift and I'll, I have a good slide of that where you'll actually shift to one side because one leg might accept more weight than the other because it's stronger or more flexible. Uh, so we're, this is part of the screening process. Um, the next test is called a hurdle step. It's a function of balance. Okay, You need balance to walk, to run, to play sports. So what we do is we isolate balance, but we're also looking at hip flexibility when we <coughs> put you in this position. Okay, So can one hip extend and one hip flex at the same time and maintain balance. Okay, So we're going to slow it way down, see what you're capable of or not capable of. The next one is pretty challenging. It's an inline lunge. Okay, um, A lot of people think it's like walking the line after for the drunk driver test there. So, um, But what this does is this puts us in our most compromised position. Okay, This really tells us a lot in this particular test when we, we actually ask you to instruct because when you're in that lunge position on the balance beam, we're going to actually ask you to lunge, touch your heel behind your knee, and stand back up. The question is, can you do that with good balance? Can you maintain good posture, all right, without falling off that two by six there, okay? If you need help, we'll give you help, but it gives us a clue as to whether your body has good deceleration capabilities, and that's where a lot of our injuries occur when we're decelerating. Uh, Doc and Jared talked about the Achilles tendon, great example, okay? Do I have the ability to slow down 150 pounds, 180 pounds, 200 pounds, and change direction, okay? The inline lunge gives us a good, a good insight into that. Now we get into our most important tests, which are our flexibility tests on a global scale. What this is is a screen. What Jared would do is an assessment, okay? The screening helps us put you into a category so I know whether I've got a group of people that have poor flexibility or I have a group of people that have poor motor control and we can tweak that out with all these different screens. So this is just a, a, a tool that we use. Now I can't definitely say that this person has poor flexibility. What we're looking at is actually this leg stays straight, this leg flexes, and I'm looking to see if his ankle bone can clear a vertical line here or come back on his thigh, okay? If you can't, that doesn't necessarily mean that you have bad hamstring flexibility. It could mean that you have contralateral, the opposite side leg, hip flexor tightness. I don't know yet, but that gives me a clue that I need to dig a little deeper, okay? The flip side of that is if, if someone can't do a good active straight leg raise, but I stand them up and they can do a toe touch, okay? I just demonstrated good hamstring flexibility in a standing position, okay? We take gravity out of the picture and ask them to stabilize with their core, all right? That's a clue to me, to our staff, that that person probably doesn't have good motor core control to stabilize their hips and do a straight leg raise. So it may not be a hamstring tightness or a hip flexor tightness problem. It might be a core stability problem. Good example, I had a uh, point guard for a local basketball team today screening her. Same thing, she scored fairly low, but she stood up and she was able to touch her toes. Okay, her dad was there, good opportunity to teach to say, aha, let's show, let's see what happens here. We turned on her core with a simple exercise and her straight leg raise went to near perfect. Okay, but that's what we're looking at when we take you through the screen to clear out maybe it's not a true hamstring problem and that's what this test can do for us. The next, <clears throat> uh, that's not a mobility, this is our trunk stability test. It's not a push-up test, it's not an upper body strength test. We want to, what this test does is it looks to see if you can lock up your core and generate force through your upper body. Okay. Then we have a couple clearance tests while we're there we want to check for low back problems, okay? Because if in our screen we find that you have pain, okay, stop the test, time out, go see the doctor. Get that cleared up, then come back and see us, okay? That's not our job, that's the doctor's and that's the therapist's job, okay? Uh, next test, please, okay. Rotary stability, okay? 
a lot of sports is rotation. That's where a lot of the injuries occur. Tennis, and it, it's the rotation that, that causes that. We go back to our inline lunge. What this is looking at is whether you have good core rotational control, okay? And can that force be transferred through my hips, through my core, and out my arms? So we, uh, this is a rotary stability test that we, that we run you through, okay? Uh, here's our other flexibility test, okay? This is a shoulder mobility test. This is global. Again, we're, we're screening. We're not assessing if we found a problem. This is where Jared would actually do an assessment and actually check internal, external rotation, all right? We're just seeing globally, can your scapula, okay, glide appropriately on your rib cage in opposite directions? Because when we throw or when we swing, that's actually what's going on on the back side here. We're looking at external rotation and internal rotation. Just to give you a quick, what we do is we measure the distance there to see if they're equal or unbalanced. If there's an imbalance there, you're probably at risk for having a rotator cuff problem, okay? Um, we actually do a clearance test on this one also, which is a simple impingement sign. So after we do this, we look at impingement. If you've got impingement, if you've got pain, you go see Dr. Rudolph, let Jared fix you and then you come back and see us and we'll take you to the next level, okay? So we're looking for those underlying problems, the lumbar rotator cuff to make sure I can get you back uh, into the sports and activities that appropriately. Here's some things that, we, that, that you'll see, okay? Or that, that we see that we need to fix up before we actually let you go play tennis. This young man happened to be a, a baseball player, young baseball player, and you can see some things here. Here's the hip shift. If you, if you can see this, his weight's shifting over to his right foot, and he's got his left foot heel lifting up. So he's got some mobility problems here. I don't have his toe touch, but this young man, this was his toe touch, okay? Mid-shin, not a toe touch, all right? So that presents a problem for, for him, generally speaking. And you can see what's going on with his balance here. He's really leaned over. So he's got some, a lot of underlying issues that, uh, could present themselves if he tries to play or work himself at a high level. So what we would want to do is, is work him on going back to our fundamentals, okay? Work on his flexibility, work on his core, and ramp him up. Um, this is just a, a schematic of a possible stretching program, okay? Um, we don't go right to the dynamic like uh, all the research is saying out there because if we've got a person that has a true flexibility problem, we need to fix that. We just can't go high speed right off the bat. That's like taking a rubber band and it's gonna snap, snap, snap. We're gonna eventually gonna have breakdown. We're gonna have those tendonitis. So I always put this in because I need people to understand through the screening, we need to find something or, or we're looking at, at the issues here. Is there a muscle imbalance like Jared talked about? If there is, we need to clear that up, okay? Or you're at risk for injury. Some of the ways that we help clear those muscle imbalances are through some myofascial release, some static stretching, okay? We don't just jump to the dynamic. The dynamic is our end game, that's our goal. That's your sporting activity. So there's a, there's a flow chart here on what we do and we screen and we find. If we've got normal, if we've got normal flexibility, that's great. Then we can go to some active and dynamic stretching, okay? Wake up the core and move on. During the workout, some active isolated exercises like the, the dynamic lunges and, and walking and things like those are good stretches if I've got good hip flexor f flexibility. If I've got good balance and can perform that appropriately, if not, what that's gonna do is create a muscle imbalance. So now the workout actually caused a problem and I, I don't understand, it's because we weren't doing it appropriately. Okay, so those, that's just a little bit about the spectrum of stretching that we are ultimately our, your goal is to be dynamic. Okay, um, just a couple pictures of, of some different active stretches, uh, some foam roll uh, exercises. So foam roll, a partner stretch, uh, which you would, might see in physical therapy, um, standing hip flexor, but these are not your typical stretches. Again, you need to make sure that you're doing these appropriately because you can create a, a problem if you don't do them right, okay? From there, we go into some core exercises all right, your core exercises, again, should be done properly. Your core exercises back up the flexibility exercises. 
they'll enhance the motor pattern that you just freed up. We call it naive motion. So if I stretch and I don't follow up by turning on the opposite muscle on the back side. So if I stretch my hip flexor here and I don't wake up the muscles on the back side, that hip flexor doesn't know or the glutes don't know that they work in synergistic patterns that I can actually work better now. So the core exercises wake those patterns up so you work better and prevent the injury, okay? Uh, then we take it and we put you on your feet. We integrate the stretching with balance and some strength exercises, and that's how it, you put it all together then at the end. And then you, that'll enhance your, your weekend programs. Doesn't take but an hour and a half, two times a week, and you, you can see very good results so that you enjoy your, your athletic programs. Okay? All right, thank you. Jason Rudolph, I'm an orthopedic surgeon. I have a niche subspecialty in foot and ankle uh, injuries and surgery. Uh, I also do a fair amount of uh, trauma, orthopedic fractures. I do a lot of sports medicine as well, but my, my real niche subspecialty is foot and ankles. Getting into medicine is, is uh, something I've always wanted to do. It's funny, I, you know, since forever when everybody asked me what I wanted to be, I always said I wanted to be a doctor. Now at the beginning, the reason I chose medicine was because I was going to cure cancer. I had a grandfather that died of cancer and I was going to cure it. By the time I hit high school, I realized that I'm not going to cure cancer and that I played so many sports from baseball to basketball to football to lacrosse that I saw so many injuries and injured myself enough that I decided maybe sports medicine is a better direction to go. So at that point, sports plus injuries plus medicine, that equaled orthopedic surgery. So even before getting into college. My goal was always to become an orthopedic surgeon. I went to undergraduate school at Princeton University uh, where I played football on the varsity football team so suffered plenty of injuries and therefore can relate to athletes pretty well. Uh, after college I went to medical school in Chicago at the Chicago Medical School. Uh, then I came back to the East Coast, did my residency at Monmouth Medical Center, which is a smaller community hospital on the New Jersey Shore. For my fellowship, I went down to Vanderbilt University in Nashville, Tennessee, which is now back to the big city again, where I spent a lot of time doing my subspecialty training in foot and ankle, uh, as well as uh, major orthopedic trauma. Going into my fellowship, um, at that point I was married. My wife, Dr. Stacy Resnick, also practices coordinated health. She's a podiatrist who does all foot and ankle injuries as well. The one thing she told me is, don't go into a foot and ankle, you can do anything else you want to do. So my fellowship originally was in just orthopedic trauma. And as it turned out, one of the leaders in the orthopedic division was the head foot and ankle, who had never had a fellow. And as it sort of played out, uh, most of my time was spent doing foot and ankle injuries and reconstructive trauma injuries. At this point, there's plenty of different foot and ankle injuries, so we've managed to work it out. I can do anything from you know the, the, the end of the foot, hammer toes and bunion surgery, to the middle of the foot where you're starting to deal with more arthritis and bigger arthrodesis uh, type surgeries or fusion surgeries. I've never told somebody, why did you come in? We're here, that's my job, is to see you whenever I, as soon as I can, whenever I can. So when people thank me for being able, available to see them, that's, that's the job, that's the deal, that's why I'm here. So. Last year I had a guy who was out in the woods deer hunting, fell out of his deer stand and had to crawl two miles to get to a, a street where they finally took him to the hospital and he had a terrible you know, ankle or distal tibia fracture um, and that was sort of right, right in my, my ballpark. So you know, less than a year later he's back full time to, uh, to his life, although I'm positive he's given up climbing tree stands. You know, I played sports my whole life. I have kids that now play sports. And now my guys are getting a little bit older, so now I I'm, I'm still want to be involved, so now I'm trying to become uh, more involved with those guys. 
And I think since I played sports, you, you understand the athlete attitude and you understand the moms and dads and where they're coming from and, and it, you know, it's important as the team doctor or the doctor for the, the, the athlete that even though you know they want to get out there as fast as they can and you want to get them out there as fast as you can, a lot of times you have to talk from the, the doctor perspective and make people realize that, that that's not always the safest thing or the best thing for the athlete, even though I know how much they want to get back out there and play. I knew I always wanted to be back in the Northeast. I grew up in New Jersey on the shore. I have family that were from Philadelphia and, and, and the area here. And from college, where I, I, again, I played at Princeton, we used to come up to play Lehigh and Lafayette. And I knew the Lehigh Valley fairly well. But now that the Lehigh Valley is this true cosmopolitan area and, and really a, a big city, although we're spread out over a large uh, square mileage, we have the ability here now at Coordinate Health where we have six podiatrists. We have two orthopedic surgeons specializing in foot and ankle injuries that we can offer the complete treatment for any foot and ankle injury. And that means anywhere from, uh, from diabetic shoe wear to orthotics to non-surgical treatment. We can offer now in-house. We have the ability to get an MRI done sometimes within the same visit that you're here seeing us. We have CAT scans. We have obviously high-level uh, high radiologists that read these things for us. We have the hospitals, the, the, the two hospitals and uh, three surgery centers that we can do the actual procedures at. And now everything is offered within one facility, one community, and the communication between the, the, the different doctors, even specifically within foot and ankle, is, is, is so even and so, so open that there's no reason to, uh, to go elsewhere for that because we really have created a real complete team, I think, which nobody else in the valley can offer.